With the launch of RTX 4090 and Rich's GPU review, I've spent some time with a number of pre-release DLSS 3 titles. So in today's video, I will answer a lot of the questions I saw from viewers under our last DLSS 3 video. I will also present some foundational criteria and tests that we at DF will be using to critique DLSS 3 quality. But before I get into all that, let's go to our first most common question I saw under our last video. And that is, how are you even recording DLSS 3? This is a very important question to answer as it explains why you are seeing me on the screen right now, in the flesh, and not a bunch of B-roll of game footage. Currently, there are no readily available HDMI 2.1 consumer capture cards on the market. So that means there is no way to externally capture 4K at 120Hz. As you can imagine, this is a pretty big issue as DLSS 3 was designed to accelerate 4K into and beyond 120Hz. So to get that, we've been leveraging OBS on a local computer with the RTX 4090 and setting it up to capture the screen at 4K 120FPS. Here we are using OBS because NVShare still does not offer a 4K 120 FPS option, although it does offer an 8K 60 FPS option, interestingly enough. The new media encoders in the RTX 4090 are better than those in the previous gen of cards, so 4K 120 local capture seems like it would work. This should be awesome, but it has two big flaws. The first flaw is that local capture will affect performance, so when you do use it, you're not actually showing the real performance of the GPU in the moment when the recording is happening. Secondly, local OBS recording is highly flawed because it currently does not actually work well. In fact, it works very poorly at the moment. You can record footage like you're seeing here and it will seem fine enough. The recording though will be actually dropping a ton of frames. Although you can see RTSS in the corner, for example, showing 120 FPS with DLSS 3 on and it looks fluid in person, while the recording is actually dropping a ton of frames all the time. There's missing frames, lurches, and even more. 9 out of 10 times a recording that you will make using this method will be deeply flawed. This means recordings you may see elsewhere across the web at 4K could possibly be wrong and full of artifacting that is not there locally. The footage you will be seeing in this video of 120 FPS slowed down has been manually scanned using an FCAT border to make sure that the footage that I'm showing on screen is not dropping any frames in the recording at all so that the footage has a flawless real frame rate. To even get but 10 seconds of flawless footage can sometimes take hours on end of redoing recordings. Since recording footage of DLSS 3 at full resolution is so flawed, it means I do not have nearly enough footage at the intended resolution and frame rate that I would actually like to do this video at, so I cannot offer a 100% definitive analysis of DLSS 3. But I'm getting there, and I have some good preliminary critiques and a lot of info. I just need an HDMI 2.1 capture card really, really badly. Another question I saw under our video was asking, does DLSS 3 work with VSync? And to answer that, let's first look at what DLSS 3 is doing in theory. As I described in our last video, DLSS 3 is a technology that generates a frame in between two traditionally rendered frames. This frame is generated with the help of motion vectors from the game engine, which explain the movement of opaque geometry, as well as an optical flow image generated on a separate fixed function block on the RTX 4000 GPUs called the optical flow accelerator. This generated frame can be called an AI generated frame essentially, as a machine learning program on the GPU is deciding the information from these two images and how to combine them or which ones to use essentially to make that final in-between frame. The AI generated frame fills the time gap between the two traditional frames. In practice it looks like this. Traditional 60 FPS on the left, DLSS frame generation capped at 120 FPS on the right. Both are running at half speed on YouTube so you can actually see the DLSS 3 frames. As you can see, DLSS 3 on the right is smoother than the traditional 60 due to the AI frames filling the gaps. You should also notice in this footage here that there is absolutely no tearing on the right hand side. DLSS 3 frames are being synced here. 
Yet according to NVIDIA, VSync is currently not supported while G-Sync is supported. And when you turn on DLSS 3 in most games, VSync options in-game become grayed out and non-functional. So how am I showing clearly synced footage with Spider-Man at 120 FPS with DLSS 3? The answer is simple. I'm using VSync. I forced externally in the NVIDIA control panel and it worked perfectly fine in the pre-release version of Spider-Man that I had access to for the last video. This obviously contradicts NVIDIA's commentary to us, so let's investigate. For one, NVIDIA's comments have confused me a little bit. See, since around 2015, the control panel option to turn on G-Sync is typically only half of what turning on G-Sync actually does and requires. G-Sync is most known for its ability to allow variable refresh rates without tearing below the monitor's max refresh rate. Turning on the first option here allows it to do that, but if you go above the refresh rate, the game will tear. To prevent that, you have to turn on the second part of G-Sync's total function. To turn on that function of G-Sync, you have to turn on G-Sync, and then, usually, go into the global settings of NVCP and force on V-Sync there globally. With both of these options on, you will not see tearing below and not above your monitor's max refresh rate. Either way, Apparently syncing is supported in some capacity as you're seeing synced footage of the Lyra or Lyra Unreal Engine 5 demo here with DLSS 3 on. Zero tears sticking to 120 FPS at 4K. So obviously syncing can work in some capacity. Syncing works in multiple games that I've tested out with DLSS 3 with their pre-release patches. That is with V-Sync being forced with or without G-Sync set to on. That means half of the frames being presented here in the footage you're seeing are AI-generated frames, and the other half are traditional frames. Basically, my experience seems to contradict NVIDIA's official stance on VSync support. So when I asked further about VSync, NVIDIA told us that VSync is not supported now, but there are plans to support it in the future, as currently VSync can at times introduce back pressure to the game, which makes pacing uneven. Based on NVIDIA's response, it seems like syncing or v-syncing can work, but it will not always work. And I think I found out what that looks like when it doesn't work in Microsoft's Flight Simulator. Here I'm going to slow down some footage I made of the game running at a v-synced 120 FPS with DLSS 3. Slow down, of course, on YouTube to have speed so you can actually see those DLSS 3 frames there. Here I'm going to ping it back and forth in the footage so you can see what I'm talking about, and I think we're seeing an uneven pacing issue. I've scanned this footage, of course, with our frame tools, and it's actually a perfect 120 FPS, so the frame rate is not the issue here. Rather, each rendered frame are showing a non-linear amount of time per frame, so the camera moves an uneven distance between frames while panning. This leads to stuttery and jerky looking movement even at a perfect 120 FPS when DLSS 3 is enabled. I saw this behavior when forcing syncing with or without G-Sync being active. In the end, this means the following. DLSS 3 does not officially support V-Sync. In our opinion at DF, V-Sync is kind of needed for G-Sync to work in the way that I think it should be working. As if you do not force it globally, I think you usually see tearing there with G-Sync on. If you do force it, it can work wonderfully, but it can also not work wonderfully, like we see in Flight Simulator here. I think NVIDIA needs to clear up a little bit of that confusion there around G-Sync, as well as work towards a 100% working V-Sync with DLSS 3. Another question I saw in the comments was, does DLSS 3 AI frame generation require DLSS image reconstruction? The answer there is a simple no. In nearly all the games I've tested so far, DLSS 3 frame generation option is a separate option from the other DLSS options, and it can be toggled separately. So if you want to use frame generation without DLS image reconstruction, you can do that. That means you can run it with TAA at native resolution or any other type of image quality treatment that you want. Frame generation is a separate option. One of the last questions I commonly saw was, does DLSS 3 look good and work well at low frame rates? Given everything about DLSS 3 and the power of an RTX 4090, I think DLSS 3 was designed around an HFR experience. That means high frame rate, usually greater than 100 FPS. And at above 100 FPS, it looks excellent. I think the last video I made showed that off. But when does it start becoming less convincing 
And I think the answer to that depends upon the content. In a game like Flight Simulator, for example, where there's such low motion in the game that it is not really a good judge for motion artifacts due to DLSS 3. If I were to exclude the V-Sync induced stutter that this title has, you wouldn't actually see that much of a difference due to this low amount of motion here. Same with Cyberpunk 2077, for example, at 60 FPS. DLSS 3 at 60 FPS here looks impressively similar to a traditional 60 FPS rendered in the normal way. Even when doing reloads of your weapon right next to the camera, that is the thing about DLSS 3. For games in first person, or those without a bunch of motion chaos, it is going to look surprisingly good, even at a low frame rate. Those kind of games and experiences, though, are not the interesting, challenging tests. Cyberpunk isn't that of an interesting test for DLSS 3 for how it holds up in motion. Something like Spider-Man or Lyra or Lyra, however you pronounce it, are actually good representations of movement and challenging movement scenarios that allow us to judge how low we can actually go with DLSS 3. I mean, in these type of games, there's a lot of motion in the center of the screen due to that third person character model. It's zipping all around, animating in a more chaotic way, something you really don't get actually in first person games, whether they be racers, simulation games, or something like Cyberpunk's role playing. And when we do this and look at games like this, for example, this example here in Lyra with the character running, I think we can see some issues with a 60 FPS conversion here with DLSS 3 on the right hand side. It looks fine, but I would say that if you look at the frame very specifically when the character is moving, you can see some extra aliasing in there that you definitely do not see on the normal traditionally rendered 60 FPS side of the screen. Same in Spider-Man, when the character is moving in a really hectic manner. I think you see that exact same issue essentially. DLSS 3 at 60 FPS can convey the motion, I would say, but it does it in a way where it seems flawed and imperfect unlike at a higher FPS that I've been showing consistently in this video and in the videos before. Based upon my testing that I did specifically in the Lyra demo, I found around 80 FPS to be the point at which DLSS 3 starts looking a lot more like the real deal traditional 80 FPS that we see here on the left hand side. The image persistence per frame is short enough so that you don't really tend to notice the individual artifacts that can be found in a frame. Here I did these 80 FPS recordings by hooking up the RTX 4090 to a capture card and recording at 240Hz 1080p using one third rate VSync. This topic though of how low can you go with DLSS 3 brings me to the core of how we at DF are actually going to judge DLSS 3 image quality. Our analysis of DLSS 3 and other similar techniques that will come out in the next couple of years most likely is going to be different than how I analyze DLSS 2, FSR, and XDSS or anything similar. The reason for this is because of image persistence. Let me start with an example that is not actually about DLSS 3, but it's about DLSS 2. When I reviewed Hitman 3 getting its DLSS patch, I pointed out how its version of DLSS at release had this visual artifact in the distance where you could see visible trailing occurring behind this guard here walking in the distance. The reason I point this out in the video is because this artifact was readily visible at a normal frame rate speed at normal viewing distance without any zooming at all. It was plainly visible just by playing the game. That is actually how I do all of my image quality analysis. By playing the games, I generate a list of image quality scenarios where I tend to see issues at normal viewing distance at normal game speed. I want to do that exact same thing with frame generation looking for those issues that are visible at normal viewing distance at normal game speed. But for the purpose of this video, it's hard to do it the same way I've done in the past because frame generation presents artifacts very differently than say DLSS 2 did. With this guard example in Hitman 3 and DLSS 2, the error we are seeing here is occurring in every single frame of the game. It shows a trail of issues in every single frame continuously over the arc of movement. This allows the error to enter our visual perception as an obvious artifact, even though it can take up a small percentage of the overall screen. Basically, its continuous nature makes it obvious, even though it's small. 
With frame generation artifacts, you do not have continuous error. You have a perfect frame, followed by an AI generated frame with potential artifacts, followed by another perfect frame. And this happens over and over again ad infinitum. And you're not seeing the error continuously. Rather, you're seeing error strobed at you in between perfection. At a rapid speed like 120 FPS, this strobing makes artifact detection at normal view distance at normal game speed surprisingly difficult and different than the way I would do it with something like DLSS 2. Artifacts with frame generation are strangely harder to perceive than those with image reconstruction. And I cannot even show this rapid strobing effect on YouTube as you know YouTube is limited to 60 FPS, so I'm slowing down footage in everything you see. Basically, the video you are seeing here on YouTube is not representative. Let me give you an example of what I mean with Spider-Man that I used in my last video. In that video, I showed an error in this area around Spider-Man's legs in this frame in the middle. I thought it was caused by disocclusion, and it probably is. The thing is, in actual motion at 120 FPS, I did not notice this error when I was playing the game. I only noticed it after the fact when I was combing through my footage frame by frame. And only then I saw the error when looking at a still frame. The strobing nature of perfect, imperfect, perfect, etc., made my brain not perceive the specific artifact when playing. This is interesting as the size of the error in screen space, as you can see here, is actually rather large in a stopped frame. So the strobing made me not see this artifact. But at the same time, the strobing made me notice another artifact. In this scene with Spider-Man climbing the building, at a full speed at 120 FPS, with this strobing behavior, I saw a kind of aliasing or flickering around the area near the lower half of Spider-Man's body. I noticed this at full speed, 120 FPS, at normal viewing distance. If I pause a frame, I think you can see why. There are these dark lines that pop up near Spider-Man's legs in AI-generated frames here that do not appear necessarily in the traditionally rendered ones. When Spider-Man's animation cycles over and over again on repeat here, this cyclical appearance and disappearance of this artifact allowed my brain to perceive it, I think. In essence, I was seeing a flicker at full speed around Spider-Man's legs. I think this error is interesting because it's comparatively small in comparison to the other error I showed on Spider-Man's feet in the cutscene. Yet due to how image persistence works, I can see this smaller error as it's constantly repeating. But I did not notice the larger error in the cutscene as it was a one-off error. This is what I'm going to call scenario one for judging frame generation image quality. Cycling animations in front of the camera. That's something I'm going to look at in future DLSS3 videos. Basically, any animation that repeats itself. This can lead to visible error, as we see in Spider-Man, due to that cycling nature. Fortunately, of all the games I really have access to in this video, not really any of them are very good for examining this. They're all really first person or do not have this kind of cycling animation close to the camera in such a rapid way like Spider-Man has it. Even Lyra isn't that fast. Another type of error that I noticed with DLSS 3 that I saw at full speed playback at normal view distance was in scene transitions. Basically when one camera cuts to another shot that looks very different. Check out Flight Simulator here at 120 FPS slowed down here to half at YouTube. I think it will be a bit exaggerated at half speed, but at full speed, it almost looks like a frame drop occurs when the camera cuts. If we check out what is happening with the frames in sequence around that camera cut, we can see that the intermediate AI generated frame is just a big old artifact in its own right. At full speed, this full screen artifact, even for one frame due to its size, looks like a flash or a frame drop, depending upon its brightness level. This is an artifact I've seen with DLSS 3, so it's scenario 2 on our list here. But I'm honestly a little surprised this is happening, as I would imagine DLSS 3 could maybe see if the scene is changing due to motion vectors, but maybe not in this game. So we have two scenarios of interest so far. A third scenario I found is in HUD presentation or in thin transparencies. I showed this off in the last video with Spider-Man, but basically HUD elements are interpolated up to the frame rate you're targeting and are technically not correct in those AI-generated frames. 
This is the least noticeable of the three scenarios that I've described so far. One usually doesn't notice the HUD distorting, and you will maybe only really notice it if you're looking at a particular HUD element that is complex and you're staring directly at it. At full speed, like 120 FPS, HUD distortion from AI frame generation typically presents as a slight darkening of the HUD element when the camera is moving, and that's really about it. Thin transparency is similar to the HUD darkening. If the transparency is very thin, it may alias and not show up as complete in an AI generated frame. Due to the strobing of frames, it can make some thin transparencies look a little bit darker to your mind's perception. A fourth issue that I've noticed that possibly happens is with rapid flashing, like a muzzle flash, for example. This one, like the HUD scenario, is actually not too big and easily noticeable, but with rapid flashes like these gunshots here, you can see that the DLSS3 gunshots seem a bit less bright in motion. And this is kind of how it presents at 120 FPS, slightly not as bright flashes. If you slow down the footage, you can maybe see why. The generated frames before and after a flash can have this artifact here. In aggregate in motion, it makes the muzzle flash appear slightly darkened. And with that, I come to my last scenario regarding image quality and frame generation with DLSS 3, and that is erratic mouse movement in a third person game, typically by causing disocclusions. Like here you see Spider-Man right next to this water tower. If I go absolutely nuts with the mouse in front of this water tower, rapidly moving it back and forth, you can start to see some of that frame generation break down. If you look at the area around Spider-Man's body, you can see kind of a reprojection error of sorts right around him. Technically, there's even more artifacting going throughout the entire frame, but the area where it is really noticeable is in that center area around Spider-Man. This one is really limited to just mouse users as a controller cannot move anywhere near as fast as this, but it is something that I can imagine happening in third person games with really, really fast mouse movement. With that being said, those are the five scenarios or areas that I have noticed so far that are going to become interesting testbed scenarios for frame generation quality. And I honestly think I'm going to find more over time as I play more games, especially ones like Spider-Man. Man, that game seems like it's going to be an awesome test bed for frame generation. One thing I've done to discover these five scenarios is to compare DLSS3 frame generation at the same frame rate as a traditionally rendered frame rate. For example, here you can see Cyberpunk 2077's benchmark running at 4K 120 FPS in the traditional manner on the left and on the right hand side with DLSS3 frame generation. Now, rendering a traditional 120 FPS at a high resolution like this is not going to be achievable for all games. So I may not be able to always do this comparison, but when I can do it like here, you can find some pretty cool differences there with DLSS 3. To get 4K 120 in the traditional way in Cyberpunk, that required me to turn off ray tracing and to make use of DLSS in ultra performance mode. And when I lined up at the same settings with DLSS 3 here, my first impression was, wow, DLSS 3 actually looks really, really similar to that traditional 120 FPS. And I think even at YouTube at half speed, you'll have a very similar impression there. Like I mentioned earlier though, a game like Cyberpunk with its first person perspective, its camera motion, etc. Well, this type of game is very easy on DLSS 3. It's going to look high quality here due to the type of content we're looking at. But still, I did notice an interesting difference when I put recordings side by side at 120 FPS played back at full speed. Going back to the beginning of that bench there, check out the floor here. Notice how in traditional rendering, at this moment, this part of the floor looks stable. You can see the detail on the floor and the normal map lines on its surface. That same area with DLSS 3 in that moment instead has a moiré pattern. And I noticed this at full speed, normal viewing distance. This is a classic case of Moiré 2. You know, those parallel lines often produce this kind of error in games. Both of these videos, though, are running at DLSS Ultra Performance Mode, which is 720p to 4K. So why exactly does DLSS 3 have this happening, even though they're running at the same resolution? The answer comes if we look at DLSS 3 frames in sequence here. As you can see, traditional frame on the left, AI-generated frame in the middle, traditional frame on the right again, 
we can see that even traditionally rendered frames here have the Moire pattern on them. This means the issue is not in the AI generation itself, it's just that the AI generated frame is inheriting the Moire issue from the traditionally rendered frames. This is a great insight about DLSS3 actually, as it means DLSS3 can inherit image quality faults from traditionally rendered frames. But still, you may be wondering why the traditionally rendered frame even has this error in the first place. And the reason is because image reconstruction actually gets better the higher your frame rate is. We can see this if we put traditional 60 FPS on the left here, traditional 120 FPS in the middle, and DLSS3 120 FPS on the right. Notice how the traditional 60 FPS has the same Ware issue as DLSS3 at 120 FPS, while the traditional 120 FPS in the middle does not have this issue. The thing is, with the traditional 120 FPS, the frames are closer together. So DLSS Super Resolution, even in Ultra Performance Mode, has a better understanding of the surface. 120 FPS resolves better anti-aliasing than 60 FPS. And since DLSS3 is only rendering a traditional 60 frames in the normal manner, it inherits the image quality of a 60 FPS presentation, even though it animates just as smooth as a 120 FPS one. As you can imagine, a geek like me found this really interesting. And that's kind of where I am right now with our methodology to analyze image generation. I have a list of at least five scenarios right now where I can see issues cropping up, and I have a nice consistent way to do ground truth comparisons, presuming the game allows me to do them. So now let's talk about input latency in DLSS 3, which is a really interesting topic. As you can imagine, it inherently adds input latency due to the fact that it holds a frame like you're seeing here to compare between them to generate that in-between frame. This is generically measurable with vSync set to off. I tested this in Cyberpunk 2077 in this area you see here, running around and shooting. I compare DLSS 3 4K performance mode with vSync off to DLSS 2 performance mode with vSync off, both with reflex on, of course. Measurements were made with NVIDIA frame view, which captures PC latency right before the monitor latency. So there's none of that monitor latency included here. So we're just seeing what's going on essentially in the rendering pipeline. The numbers look like this. DLSS 2, 25 milliseconds of latency here versus 35 milliseconds latency of DLSS 3. That around 10 milliseconds of latency cost is essentially the cost of what is happening by generating that extra DLSS 3 frame in aggregate. DLSS 3 is of course performing better here if we look at those average frame rate numbers at the cost of that latency. But who wants to play with all that screen tearing and vSync off? I do not. So here are those same numbers with vSync. DLSS 2 in performance mode is 30 milliseconds now, and DLSS 3 in performance mode is 110 milliseconds. Whoa! It's adding a ton of more input latency here with vSync. That's not very good, but it makes sense if we think about it. VSync engaged here with DLSS 2 is still below the vSync limit of 120 FPS if we look at its average frame rate. So its input latency is not too different. But DLSS 3, which is far in excess of 120 FPS without vSync, is now at that vSync number and it is waiting. The GPU is waiting and not performing to its fullest. It's just queuing up frames, waiting and waiting, causing it to be dramatically slower in response. We can see this in the GPU power as well, where the GPU is consuming 50 less watts in DLSS 3 than it is in DLSS 2. Now, 110 milliseconds is not awful, but it's not great. It's actually slower than DLSS 2 4K performance mode at 60 Hertz with vSync, as you're seeing here in the graph. So if you were to play the game like this, it would be like playing a slightly heavier input latency than playing the game stock at 60 FPS without frame generation on.
Okay, so let's show another test that is eye-opening and explains a lot about what you need to do with DLSS 3. DLSS 2 in 4K quality mode in that same scene with VSync has 36 milliseconds of input latency. DLSS 3 in 4K quality mode in that same scene with VSync has 49 milliseconds of latency. Yes, you are seeing that correctly. In quality mode, DLSS 3 here has lower latency than in performance mode. And the reason is because it is not hitting the VSync limit. VSync is not capping the GPU anymore, and it is going full throttle, leading to a better and unhindered response. We can see that in the power consumption now, where DLSS 3 is only moderately below DLSS 2's power consumption. Based upon what I can feel in the mouse movement and say about DLSS 3, my recommendation for anyone using it, if you're going to use G-Sync or V-Sync, is to make sure you are not hitting your monitor's refresh rate in terms of frame rate. You need to have the GPU going full blast to avoid incurring a lot of extra latency. To do this, do as I did here in the example. I tuned the settings or the resolution to be high enough to make that the case, so that it is constantly below the maximum frame rate limit that your refresh rate imposes on you. Just doing it with a normal frame rate limiter like RiverTuner Statistics Server is not enough. That will only minimally decrease input latency. The best way to decrease input latency with DLSS 3 is to be below the max VSync frame rate. Okay, with that being said, I think I'm done with this coverage of DLSS 3 for now. I've covered quite a lot here. I have a list of scenarios, a starting list at least, where we can find image quality faults with frame generation in DLSS 3. Importantly, this list is different than the list I would be using for analyzing something like DLSS 2, as image persistence changes which issues are relevant. Of those issues, some are more significant than others. I would say the ones that I'm labeling here in red are noticeable, yellow are less noticeable, and green are even less noticeable, slash placebo actually. I have also talked about input latency, discovering very crucially that you want to avoid hitting your max VSync refresh rate frame rate by making your in-game settings heavy enough. This is a bit counterintuitive, but also fascinating. Basically, if you're gonna use VSync, which I'm definitely going to be doing when I use DLSS 3, you want to be below your max frame rate. Altogether, I would say DLSS 3 in aggregate here over this entire video is rather incredible tech. I think at 120 FPS, the quality holds up incredibly well next to Ground Truth. And I think its best use case is to enable experiences that were not possible before. Check this out. Cyberpunk on the left is 4K DLSS quality mode without frame generation on with no ray tracing. On the right is Psycho ray tracing, but with frame generation at that same resolution. DLSS 3 on the right hand side here is enabling higher quality settings and it has a much higher motion fluidity due to having a higher frame rate. If you were to compare PC latency between these two sides, you would have 34 milliseconds of PC latency on the left and 49 milliseconds on the right. This is the kind of trade-off that DLSS 3 is all about in my eyes. Much better settings, higher frame rates, but then you have this added input latency that I think is rather minimal considering what you're gaining in return. That is how I would use DLSS 3, as it is a nice win. Now we just need to see how NVIDIA evolves this in the future. It definitely needs official vSync support, and it also needs to clear up some of those more visible errors, like the camera cut ones I talked about earlier. But that is really enough for me for now. If you did like this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support DF on Patreon to get years worth of Digital Foundry content in high quality for download. Otherwise, comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bring you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.